and Suitsat is deployed. Although haunting, evoking the image of a stranded astronaut floating away from their spacecraft, Suitsat is on its way, heading into the Earth's orbit. Filled with ham radio equipment, it's ready to transmit pre-recorded messages from school students and enthusiasts around the world. Houston reports a good deploy to ensure no recontact with the International Space Station. Suitsat's orbit will decay in a few weeks, where it will then enter the Earth's atmosphere and burn up. Hi, Sister Houston, this is Commander Diaz. Do we have any debris close to our trajectory? Evening, Commander. Negative on that. Clear sailing as far as we can see down here. If there was any cause for alarm, you'd know we'd see it too. Your crew members can keep sleeping tight. Well, I'm seeing something out there. I can't make it out, but whatever it is, it's getting closer. I'll tell you, Commander. We're not getting it. Houston, repeat again. I'm not going to believe this. I'm picking up transmissions on the ham radio that sound identical to the suit side experiment. And that debris? It's an Orland spacesuit. I'm not sure I'm hearing you right. Repeat that, Commander? Suit set. I'm seeing suit set. You're mistaken, Diaz. Suit set re entered the atmosphere and burned up years ago. It's impossible. Yeah, I know it's impossible. But I don't know what I'm saying. It's suit set. It's come back. And it's not just in orbit. It's headed right for the ISS. It's not making any sense. Can you say that again? Man. Hey everyone! Oh, what's that sound? It's this month's new Unreal Online Learning Course, a dedicated learning path on the Quartz Music System. 
Learn how to bring music into your game to immerse your players, discover how to create background playlists, implement one-shots, and then time it all to perfection. Tune into the Unreal Online Learning Portal to start mixing today. Using the power of volumetric video technology, co-build headliners Coldplay and BTS brought fans into their universe for a live performance on The Voice. Dance over to the Unreal Engine feed to read how the creative agency, All of It Now, leveraged Unreal Engine to bring real-time holograms of each band member to the stage. When adapting Resident Evil 4 to VR, Capcom entrusted the job to experienced VR developer Armature Studio. They had one mantra, is it fun? Hear from their team on how they recreated the original game's assets, fine-tuned its gameplay, and sought the balance between remaining faithful to the classic and making an outstanding VR experience. From Epic Mega Grant recipient Devada Game Production, Biwar Legend of Dragon Slayer is an action-adventure puzzler set in a fantastical world inspired by Indonesian mythology. Play as Biwar, a boy traversing the jungles to hunt down the dragon who killed his parents. Sort of Steam to download and play their demo today. This gorgeous little village was created in UE5 by Devin Chapman, using a variety of Quixel Mega Scans and modular building pieces. Take a stroll through the town and see the complete piece on Devin's ArtStation page. And we'll leave you with an out-of-this-world piece from Arganian Prime, showing the size and power of the spacecraft against the planets behind it. Blast over to their ArtStation page and explore all of their stellar content and behind-the-scenes shots. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I am your host, Tina, and today with me, we have a slew of guests. So we're going to go down the line one at a time to make sure that we can introduce everybody. So first up, we have Gabby. Hi, everybody. My name is Gabriella. I'm also known as Feeding Wolves, and I am an all-engine virtual production artist specializing in motion capture with an emphasis on metahumans. Awesome. Next up, we have Nick. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick. I uh, Currently, I teach at Drexel University. I teach uh, motion capture and virtual production. I have a background in feature film visual effects, so I um, have been involved in this area for uh, getting about 20 years now. And I ran the animation and visual effects program at Drexel for six years before launching what is now becoming the virtual production program. And uh, so I was in the Unreal Engine Virtual Production Fellowship with Gabby uh, just last year. And so uh, just really excited to get to share from all of that experience. And we're excited to have you here. <laughs> Next up, we have Jax. Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is Jax. Uh, I'm currently working at IOMAX X Lab as a senior animator. Before I joined IOMAX Lab, I worked at uh, LucasArts on Star Wars The Force Unleashed back in 2006. That was a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, Disney IMD Christmas Carol and EA Dead Space and Battlefield. My recent projects at IOMAX Lab include Vader in Model, the uh, a Star Wars VR experience, and then Tales from the Galaxy Edge uh, VR, and then Star Wars Secret of the Empire, Marvel The Eternal, and then The Old Republic Disorder Cinematic Trailer, and the Star Wars Hotel Galactic Star Cruiser. Thank you. So much great work there. Next up, we have Simon. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Simon. I'm a lead technical animator at IDOS Montreal. Uh, I have a long background in rigging, but mostly in the last few years, I dedicated my work and uh, all my attention to working on facial animation, building pipelines, and all that. And more recently, uh, our company just shipped uh, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. And uh, very excited to join everybody here for a conversation about uh, facial animation and all aspects of it. A lot of hype around Guardians for sure. <laughs> and then last but certainly not least, we have Deepak. Hey everybody, uh, Deepak Chetty. Uh, I work for Epic as part of Unreal Online Learning. So if you've taken any of the courses, the free courses that we have concerning uh, linear media, cinematics, anything like that, it's likely something that I've produced. Uh, so 
yeah, happy to be here. It's really excited to see this this panel of people, uh, some of which you'll realize are, are authors for us, uh, actually creating these courses uh, as we move on. So, Tina, with your permission, I will just give our general uh, introduction in terms of why we're here and what we're going to be talking about. Um, and then we can take a look at some content from Faceware. So the main reason that we're gathered here today to discuss uh, facial performance capture uh, is through the lens of democratization and how we're using it through various aspects and various uh, verticals inside of multiple different industries. So on this panel here, we have people who have been doing this like Nick for decades. Uh, we have people who are relatively new to the space like Gabby. They're all doing incredible work. But one thing that sort of brings all of us together today for this conversation is we're using Faceware technology to drive uh, all the animation that we're creating from live performances. So with that, I think what would be great is if we cue the Faceware video you can show you all that reel. You can check out the sizzle. You can see the tech, where this is being used technology-wise. I think you're going to be very familiar with a lot of the clips uh, that you're being shown here, and then we can jump into it. We can just get started. Just, I love that reel so much, being able to see all of the projects just lined up like that. So, so cool. Yeah, the, you know, once again, thanks, thanks y'all for being here. Like, it's, this is like a special treat, in, in, especially for those of you who follow uh, Unreal Online Learning and are taking the courses. One thing that I'd like to get out of the way is that our first course launched uh, using Faceware Studio. Uh, Nick, right here uh, on the top right, he authored that course. It's a fantastic course. Uh, so any of you looking to get right into this stuff, you know, the course has been out for a couple of weeks. There's some feedback out there. Uh, and any sort of questions and comments you can give us would be absolutely fantastic as we continue this. The main reason we're all here, though, once again, is to talk about the democratization of this stuff. What we're doing at UOL is we've actually created a learning path that we're going to be releasing throughout this year. So by the end of this year, you will have at least four courses on Faceware slash Unreal technology in collaboration uh, to create compelling, dramatic, engaging facial performances for your pieces to bring your characters to life. So full disclosure, this is not just for linear media. We're going to talk a lot about linear media today, but you can expect that a lot of these techniques that are being used and that we're going to discuss can also be used for nonlinear media or, you know, interactive um, with with some, you know, exceptions, which which might get brought up through the course of this panel. Uh, but with that, like what I'd really like to kick this off with um, is just sort of going around the group here and talking about, you know, how you got started, where you came from, and in, in your opinion, you know, where this technology has actually matured and come from if we, if we take a look back maybe, let's say, five years from now. So we obviously can include the, the time we've all spent during COVID where virtual production techniques and all sorts of stuff like that were completely accelerated, uh, which I believe has led to a boom in home studios and, you know, people getting into this sort of technology. But it would be great, yeah, if we could just sort of hear where y'all are coming from. You know, you can give us the full story. We got time here to talk and dissect and go through, you know, what y'all's experiences have been. And uh, I think one thing to add, too, is 
what the sort of proliferation of this technology, meaning like how you're starting to see facial performance capture enter all sorts of types of projects, how that sort of changed your outlook on things as well. Cool. So yeah, Gabby, why don't we start with you? That'd be great. Hi, everybody. And um, really good question. So um, I started with absolutely nothing, zero, no experience, uh, no hardware, no equipment, bartender. And this was a little over a year ago. And I decided to learn about virtual production. I took the uh, Jonathan Winbush MoGraph.com Unreal Engine course and I looked at it like it was my full full time job. I fully committed to learning Unreal, and within three weeks, I was um, I was creating content. And from there, I uh, I got my first taste of motion capture with Miss with gloves, and then with Xens. And at that point, I was looking for a a full body motion capture solution, a character that had like blend shapes. I didn't even know what blend shapes were. But that's how new I am to this industry. I'm brand new. So uh, I remember Katie Joe from Xsense said to me when I asked her, I was like, can I create like Alita Battle Angel face performance? And she said, you can use like the best facial motion solution, but it will also depend on the quality of the rig you have. And then the meta humans were released last year. And the amount of I would say they're close to perfect. The amount of work that has gone into them. If anyone's looked at the Siren demo, which I think is a couple years old, and you're looking at this demo that took an army of people, and we now have this technology for free, thanks to Epic Games, Three Lateral. We have all of this. Like, So I guess I would say I represent all of the independents who never really stood a chance to make content that will ever be at the studio quality level. And now we have this technology. Uh, Nick, apparently you worked on Benjamin Button. I'm looking at the history of facial motion and how incredible the technology was. I looked at like Tron and just seeing how digital characters have been coming to life and requiring these massive teams. And all I did was I installed Faceware. I put some DSLR footage of my face because I didn't even know what an HMC was. And I put my face, you know, streamed it through Faceware. I just attached the motion logic blueprint to a meta human. And I actually saw my character come to life for the first time. And this has been so exciting. So for anybody who is, you know, new to this world and is looking at it like, oh, I can't do that. If I can do it with absolutely no background, like nothing at all, then all of those indies out there that are listening, like you really should like try and fully commit to something that will absolutely change your life. That's really nice Great to answer. hear. And, you know, it, it, it goes really into that concept for a lot of you, you know, hopefully the people watching this, if you're on the fence about like, you know, is this worth my time? Like, is this, is this going to take over my life? Well, it, it may, but at the same time, you know, if you just want to, you know, dip your toes in the pool, so to speak, and get just to start understanding like what you can actually do with this technology, you can see that, you know, it, it is not the amount of time requirement that it would have been years ago. And I, I can personally attest to that uh, because before we go to Nick, like, you know, because I think I can sort of stitch some of this stuff together as we go through, you know, I, I've been teaching at UT Austin in the film uh, and fine arts departments for the last seven years. Like I, I am very familiar with the pains and the tribulations of trying to democratize a process like facial performance capture to be able to teach it to people. And, you know, what, what these, what everyone we have assembled here is doing and what, what they can bring to the table in this conversation is going to go a long ways towards making us all realize that, you know, this, this is like the peak time to be alive in the history of the world. If you've ever wanted to like be a part of this yourself and be inspired by the, you know, the amazing people we got here. So with that, Nick, let's, yeah. Can you give us a little bit more about your background and where you came from and what you see with this tech? Sure. Yeah. I, I, um, and thanks, Gabby, for the uh, note about Benjamin Button. And I mean, I think Gabby is, you know, a, spot on with everything she shared and, and is a great example. Um, you know, I've been in the industry for a while and I had no input on that 
face wear sizzle reel, but it's kind of strange and it's kind of bookended where there were shots from Benjamin Button near the beginning of that that I had worked on. And there was a shot from my uh, fellowship film uh, at the end. And um, I just felt like, wow, there's it just suddenly dawned on me seeing them in the same uh, real that wow, there's like well over there's well over a decade in between those things, and you know you look at Benjamin Button and there were hundreds of artists. I mean, when I worked on that, I was a very tiny cog in a very big machine, and it was hundreds of artists and hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, put something like that together. And each tool along the way at that time was a separate. Uh, entity. It was uh, a lot of effort on individual artists so that someone had to create the model, someone had to rig the model, someone had to animate that rig, and there was tracking that fed into that. And ultimately that got rendered through a, a rendering system and then composited in a compositing system. And all of those things for most of the decade after have been expensive, difficult things to learn. And really, for the first time with the emergence of both uh, things like Unreal Engine, and then uh, you've got the Faceware Studio, and now MetaHumans themselves, all of those different barriers are moved out of the way and they're all available free to download and and to, to start working with right away. So uh, you don't have to know how to rig a character. You don't know how to, have to know how to texture a character or do hair grooms. Uh, learning those things will let you customize your characters a lot more but you can get started by downloading a pre-existing free metahuman or create a custom metahuman and download that for free put it into unreal engine and you are now rendering that metahuman you want to animate its face any camera that shoots any 2d video can be put through faceware studio to then drive that metahuman's face and now you're creating your own animations. So uh, I, I don't know uh, when there, before now, when there was a time when all of those pieces were all lined up within a single ecosystem that someone could just start downloading them and get to work with them uh, in their home on their own computer. So it's a really exciting time. Yeah. And I mean, I think to, to, to jump into that point again, too, it's, you know, for people who are coming from the creative side, especially as filmmakers, right? Because we've, we've seen a huge growth of people who are in linear media, or that's their aspiration is to be using, lin you know, this sort of real-time technology for linear media, linear media and the storytelling, you know, that comes along with that. What we're seeing is like the barrier to entry literally to software knowledge too is that much lower because it's no longer a five or six program pipeline. You know, we're, we're in one program with a web interface that connects to bridge, right? Which is, you know, very objective. That's an objective workflow. So, you know, the, right now we, we are at that point where this is just, everything is just so much more approachable too, uh, and less intimidating to a degree. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, Jax, why don't you let us know what you're up to? Hi, hi. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let me give a brief intro to talk about a uh, little bit about ILM, ILM X Lab. Um, ILMX Lab is a division of Lucasfilm that founded, founded in 2015 that focusing on pioneering storytelling, immersive entertainment. So we are on the VR side. Um, so the, um, the ILMX Lab is the um, combination, combination of the talent from Industrial Line Magic, Skywalker Sound, and Lucasfilm. Uh, so we have been developing in Unreal Engine for our experiences over the years. One of the ILM XLab early projects, uh, Carne Y Arena, a VR installation done in Unreal Engine, has been awarded a special Oscar uh, in 2007. So as we put a lot of hard work into, um, so we have a first uh, full length VR experience is the Star Wars uh, Vader in model. That one uh, is a first full length Star Wars VR experience. It also won the best uh, AR VR game at the GDC 2020 awards. So um, the, because the VR is a 360 degree experience, right? So the player can turn around to see everything all the time. So that needs to be, um, the animated character has to be lively at all time. So Faceware gives us uh, a big help on adding life to the character with facial expression. I'm just using a phone for, uh, and capture myself for the, the video model uh, for all the characters, for character blinking, eye darting, and talking. So, uh, Facebook, let me quickly populate the base facial data 
and then allowed me to add a polished animation pass on top of it. So it's very thankful to Facebook, actually. That's great. All right, uh, Simon, you, I, I know you will have quite a few amazing stories to tell us during this stream. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background and what you worked on recently? Sure. Um, even before my career, I think I was always really into film and video games. And uh, I got my start in 2004 as a character rigger. Uh, I worked in rigging for about 10 years, which gave me a really strong understanding of human anatomy, body rigging, and, and just and, and faces as well. And so part of rigging is making sure that the, the rig controls is, uh, you know, are user friendly and all that. But I always gravitated to the face because I just found that I could get so much more emotions than what you get out of the body. And so even as a rigger, I always had, I don't know, dreams of working in animation. I just didn't have the chops to be an actual animator. And then skip a few years later when I worked on a game that had great cinematics that were all keyframed. So I saw the cost involved with that. And then all of our in-game animations were, uh, let's say, not up to the level of the cinematics. And so I took that as uh, sort of dropping the ball on that. So I, for the next project, I looked into ways that we can improve our facial animations, not only in cinematics, but also in gameplay. Um, that's how I discovered Facewear. And I started working with just, you know, webcam, stationary footage and eventually made my way into a, a company called IDOS Montreal that had a full performance capture studio. So that meant we could shoot body, face, and voices all at the same time, meaning that there's no need for combining all these different capture methods. And once I've worked with that, it's, uh, it's, it's really fascinating how much detail you get out of the performances. And if I skip even a little further to the actual release of the game and the way that the game's been released so uh, responded so far, we've been nominated in so many categories that like I can't name all of them, but a lot of them are uh, in the narrative category. And uh, part of that is that I think it's because of very strong writing, very strong performances all coming together. And the fact that we were able to capture that, those performances and translate them to our digital characters it's uh, it's it's really no wonder that this you know this technology is so powerful and the fact that we're making it more available to the masses i think is really amazing so hearing stories like gabby's that's just you know it's really inspiring that that somebody on their own can learn all of this uh and meanwhile i have this very long background and you know animations are animations right like it doesn't really matter where it came from um so as long as you have really good performances you have a good script a good yeah and it, it all comes together it's uh creates very, very believable characters. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's once again, see, hearing everyone's different background and seeing where y'all are approaching it from what you're doing, who you're working with too. So we get an idea of all these other companies, studios, academic institutions. I think it, it's, it's very plain and clear for me to see as somebody who's also in academia, but then, you know, working for Epic uh, that, you know, all the bases are getting covered here. You know, most most film programs that teach any sort of uh, virtual production workflow or performance capture workflow, they've been looking for solutions like this forever. So if you know, if I'm viewing it from that angle, I'm thinking, well, then the average person out there who's just trying to look at this has also been searching for the solution forever. And quite frankly, in in the in the ease or the ease of function in terms of how you can link all these things together. Like I said before, and I'm sure everyone here can agree. It's like we used to have to go from program to program to program. And now with Unreal, you know, we're really trying to bring things all under one roof, uh, including the editing. So Nick, I actually want to toss it to you real quick. You're working on a course right now uh, that we'll be releasing uh, in a couple months. Could you give us sort of a breakdown of how that works in regards to the functionality from, let's say, Facewear Studio into Unreal, if you want to modify or adjust a performance? Sure. So... You know, one of the great things uh, about Unreal that really facilitates this is that it has a full ed animation editing suite built into it. It's called the Sequencer for anyone who hasn't used it. And so any animation that you've already recorded can be brought into Sequencer and you can edit it completely within keyframe space uh, inside the sequencer. So you could take a motion capture and uh, basically bring it in the sequencer and do a step called bake to control rig. And that'll convert that entire recorded animation into a set of keyframes on a timeline. And then you can manipulate those keyframes with uh, you know, the facial control board. And that's really where 
things get more realistic. It's where as a creator, you can really shape a performance. And with any technology, you know, there could be a glitch in the data or uh, something got misinterpreted by the machine learning algorithm and something doesn't quite come out across as human or just the way you want that character delivered. So now as a creator, you can take that base and instead of having to start from a just a blank face doing nothing and then having to add each and every level of animation to that face starting, okay, now the jaw is moving. Now I've got the lip sync going. Now I've got some real expression in the eyes. A lot of that comes through from the motion capture and you can really focus your time on just editing some of the nuances and and getting you know just the right kind of lip curl that you would like and making sure that the lips come together for every single m and p and things like that and so uh the the course that i'm working on now is really going to focus on that stage of editing motion capture that's intended for recorded narrative delivery and so that's uh, really kind of the workflow that that's going to focus on. Great. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, the ability to further refine or even change a performance, you know, within the same ecosystem contextually, whether it be a narrative reason and, you know, a style reason, what have you, like, I mean, once again, we're cutting out, you know, all those other third party programs that we used to have to do round trips to, right, to, to get it back. So the iterative process of creation using technology like facewares in conjunction with Unreal, and then of course modifying the results inside of the engine, it's easier than ever. And that's something that, you know, w was not that, I keep using the word easy, and I think a lot of this stuff is, I, I hope I'm not oversimplifying it, but in many ways, like this, this process has become easy. Maybe with a lowercase e, not a uppercase e for easy, but maybe well, with a lowercase e. Yeah, but, yeah. and, and less expensive. So, I mean, one of the things that I could easily see being done is localization of a program, right? So you mm -hmm. could have a, a lead actor in, in one language that performs a role that's being used to drive a, a computer you know, computer animated character, meta human or otherwise. Uh, and then you could have your voice actors from all over the world that are creating the, the dialogue for the localized versions. And if you're shooting video, face video of them as they deliver those localized other language lines, then just the face portion, just the, just the mouth sure. lip sync of those performances could then be applied to those same characters. And so your localized awesome. versions of these animations could be fully lip synced just like the uh, original version. Yeah, that's that's a really cool example of uh, something somebody could do immediately with this. Um, so uh, I have a question for Simon in regards to, you, we're talking about this idea of the pipeline being a lot more easy, especially you with your experience with rigging, you know, you know, decade of experience with rigging. What, what was the biggest hurdle for people? Like in, I want to, putting your creator hat on if you take a step back from the studio is like what do you think the biggest like but without resources i would say without a, an abundance of resources what was the biggest hurdle before in in this pipeline or if there were multiple blockers for most people what do you think those were and do you think those have been addressed like with with the solutions we have now or the things that you see sort of like you know coming down the pipe um uh, there's a lot of ways that i could answer this question um mm -hmm. i'm trying to think the in terms of animation i think it's it comes down to a matter of cost and time okay uh the amount of animators you would have to put on a sequence and the amount of time that you had only dedicated in order to get it to a certain level of polish was incredibly high versus actually using performance capture as as your starting point so that's in terms of animation it's really that that was the biggest yeah. hurdle it's just you could just throw more animators to try to solve the situation but then it comes at a much bigger cost um, in terms of if you were to not work with performance capture, some studios would work with an audio based animation. So you would record a voice and you would have a system that would generate animations from that. Now, it's not so much of a hurdle. So it's like using the generate... waveforms to generate? Exactly. Like it'll use the waveforms? That's right. Okay, cool. It would be using waveforms and probably a text and maybe a couple of tags for emotions and things like that. And you could generate animations in a large quantity, but you're missing that realism or that um, that believability in the performance. So it's a trade-off. You can have large quantities, but not as a, at a very high quality. Um, in terms of rigging, I just think the resources that we find now, whether it's on YouTube or even on uh, you know platforms like the UOL, 
um, it, the the resources are there for basically people to learn how to rig a character and and even sculpt blend shapes or set it up with a bone system like all these resources that didn't exist when i got started so i'm, I'm thinking any any student that's starting now is years ahead of where you know i was when i started um so I, those are the kind of hurdles that i'm thinking I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think that's, you know, that it gives us a lot of insight in, into, you know, the past and sort of where we're coming with this. Uh, Jax, do you have anything to add to that in regards to how, especially in the studio system, like how have you seen, have things changed a lot in, you know, as much as you can tell us, of course, like internally in terms of like, is it a lot easier to get creative notes now? Because you know that it doesn't take so long to iterate, you know, if you're going to make a change to let's say an emotion on a face using this sort of software and this pipeline. Yeah, there's there's a good point. That's the thing that the big uh, help on uh, on the our studio pipeline. So uh, LM, uh, we are using LM pipeline for on the movie side. We are using Linux machine, mm -hmm. but uh, Faceware is only support uh, Windows. So there's a little bit hurdle. We have to do it in the Windows first, and then we have okay. to uh, copy the animation and transfer into Linux so we can polish in, inside Linux. This is uh, one of the thing. Uh, but other than that, it's all good things. <laughs> so it's all like. <laughs> Uh, because our script um, VR right, keep changing. Sometimes uh, we are thinking yep. about uh, uh, we have a lot of review, and because our 360 experience, the character need to talk here, talk there. So we keep changing. So if we have a mocap system with the old with the old time mocap, we need to hire the actor. We need to capture the, yep. the, the, the if we capture the body and the face together. And what if suddenly a line change, right? So we can just capture the face of of, of our own. And then we can apply to any any face or any creature that's also, uh, really helpful. So yeah, that's the thing. That's awesome because I think one of the things with real time technology, especially you know that we all talk about in in terms of being a huge benefit, is this ability to sort of rapid creative to have rapid creative iteration. Whereas before, yeah. you know, and we've all seen that graph. Epic posted it a lot of like the old loop of production in any phase. Right. And what what's happening with real time is the loop that now, you know, used to be this big has become a loop that's maybe like this big. All right. It's just mm. it's really shortened the duration and the amount of steps that you would have to basically get a revision. If I'm being very practical and literal, that's the term. We're going to get revisions. You need to change this. You need to change that. Even if it's your own film, you're an independent filmmaker. You're working as a one person shop just on your computer. You're making a movie with these techniques. You're going to be going back and forth a little bit. Very rarely will something hit the very first time you do it. And there's not a change that's going to be made somewhere down the line. Now, in the past, anything related to mocap, facial performance capture, that's an issue. Sometimes it is what it is. You would deal with it. You'd cover it separately you know, using camera techniques or whatnot or the edit. But with this loop that goes so quickly, like I feel like we've entered a new phase of this where it's just like, you know, in the traditional animation world, I've, I see this all the time. I know people who do this, they take reference videos of themselves to use. And Nick, I remember during the pre-conversation, you were mentioning stuff like that too. People will basically train their abilities or use reference of themselves to generate the animation. Well, in this case with an iPhone, or a DSLR or, you know, any sort of camera, anything that will create a moving image faster, ideally than 20 to 30, 24 frames per second, you are going to be able to make revisions, pop it into software real quick, have it go through the pipeline and basically be your result or be your fix without having to go through multiple different departments. And that's something that like, you know, pipelines change, they adapt. Um, I'm sure we could all say and give give our own stories to how any any place you'll work will obviously have their own proprietary stuff within their pipeline but the general concepts of the pipeline remain the same uh across the board to a degree and that's that's what's cool is especially when we're talking about learning if people start with this you're essentially preparing yourself for anything else you might encounter because you understand the fundamentals like you know exactly what the fundamentals of these pipelines are um to that end, like, you know, it's it's not just about offline. We we also have the possibility to do live. So Gabby, I'd love to bring you in here to talk a little bit about your live solution that you've you've sort of created with your MetaHuman and some of the tests that you've posted. Uh, if you could give us a little bit of insight into that, because that might be what a lot of people have been here, uh, have seen before, so. Sure, uh, I just use one software. I just use Unreal. 
I, uh, I did try Maya and Motion Builder and I used up that free trial uh, when I first started learning Unreal. And uh, with Faceware, I just, the only softwares that I actually use are the mocap softwares that I'm using, streaming directly into Unreal. So Unreal is the final destination uh, software. And everything I need is in there. I am not a professional like animator. I don't know how to rig. I mean, I have rigged before, but um, it's so simple. All I do is just feed in a video, whether it's live or pre-recorded. You can even take stock footage um, of somebody's face as long as it's like framed properly and lit properly. And you can just stream it onto your MetaHuman by assigning a blueprint and activating a plugin. That's literally the work. And then all of the extra stuff that I've kind of developed and learned, you know, I didn't know that having high frame rates when you're working in Unreal and recording mocap data is really important. Because from experience, I learned, I was like, why is my, you know, data like a little choppy? And then I was told, I was like, well, you might want to like bump up those frame rates. And metahumans are super heavy. So thanks to the fact that they have LODs, you can adjust the LODs and really get your frame rates up. So there's a lot of little tricks. Nick showed me a really great trick on if you drop a metahuman into take recorder, you can just assign um, the face that that is the only animation you want so that Unreal is not using all of this processing power in order to record all of the data from the body which you're not using. So I'm learning as I'm going along and that's how simple it is. And you can kind of adjust the facial expressions. So essentially it's Unreal based on my experience with like Maya and Motion Builder, the short experience. Uh, just to kind of get a taste of what other industries are using, that I'm able to use some of the tools in Unreal to be able to retarget my data in real time onto my MetaHuman. And I'm also able to make adjustments to the facial expressions as they're coming in in real time, which means I don't have to fix it in post, which is a really popular um, kind of thing for people to say. And I can fix it and get it as close to what I want as possible. And thanks to the people who made the face control rig board for the metahumans, the simple one is great if you're animating eye line and tongue is really, really easy with a simple face control rig board. And then the main face control rig board, because metahumans have so many different blend shapes and face bones and face where it will, will get you 90% of the way there. But then the rest of the fine tuning is done in Unreal with a control rig and an additive backwards solver. And I didn't know what any of this stuff was like, you know, like maybe six months ago. So, um, so yeah, if I can pick it up, uh, yeah, anybody can. And the videos are out there. The secret sauce is not like secret. It's out there. If you want to know how to, you know, use the face control rig board to fine tune facial animation, definitely watch the Unreal Engine video that Adam Walton did on the face control rig board. Epic has put out all of the information you really need to hit the road running. I did a kind of, overview of that video to make all the controls easier to use and how to make the keys and all of that. So the information's there. You can literally install the engine, um, install Faceware. They offer a free trial, try out either their free live link plugin that they have for 4.27. I'm currently working in 4.26 and I use the Glassbox Live Client plugin. Um, follow the instructions, I have a video on that, and Nick just released an entire tutorial. So all of the educational tools, you we take you from A to B, and then have fun. If you're not having fun, um, you're not doing it right. And at the end of the day, it really depends on what your goal is. Are you just trying to see and experience this technology for the first time, or are you trying to tell a story? Or are you using it for something else? Like I'm now exploring facts, which is a facial action coding system. I didn't even know what that was, but it's, it's basically studying uh, facial expressions. So you never really know where any of these tools are going to take you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great point. And I think your journey specifically, Gabby, is so inspirational and hopefully will remain to be that way for a lot of people who see this and watch this and get to know you uh, and interface with you because it's, it's really proof to me like, you know, somebody's in the company and also teaching, and I'm sure Nick, you'd feel the same way, you know, as an academic, it's like, 
it's there's just never been an easier time to onboard yourself into these sort of techniques. And one of the things I love about this democratized learning process that we have, not only at UOL, but all the brilliant, you know, creators out there who post their stuff on YouTube, Vimeo, wherever, just to share the the wealth of knowledge here is that, you know, it, it allows you to enter the workforce or school with already an understanding of what the processes are. So then you can further refine. So if you're a student, the goal is, and this is how we do it at UT, it's like, I don't spend time in the classroom teaching the software. That's, I don't, I teach the application of the software to what we are in school to learn. So for example, I teach, since I teach at a traditional film program, the software learning is very basic. I, you know, the call to action is, here's a bunch of videos from Unreal Online Learning. This would be what our textbook is if we were still reading stuff off of books, right? To learn software, which is how I bet a bunch of us on this call learned software back in the day, reading books that got changed every year. But, you know, so when we're in the classroom and you've already got the chance to learn this stuff from an objective point of view, you then get to apply it functionally. One of the biggest differences, I think, that a lot of educational programs, and I think even as personal goals, individuals have, so this isn't just limited to academ academia, is that in the past, you might spend weeks, months, who knows how long, working on a shot to put in your show reel, right? Or a, or a very small sequence. It's like, it is not out of the realm of possibility now to work on a film, like a short film, right? To flex those creative muscles, firing on all cylinders in all aspects of virtual production to create something, knowing that a part that used to be sort of siloed off in terms of reach, affordability, learning wise, like something like a facial performance capture pipeline is now ready and available to you. And, um, you know, you can really see that with, a, uh, you can see that in Gabby and Nick's work at the Unreal Fellowship, uh, which we can take a sec uh, to mention as well. Uh, Gabby and Nick were uh, Unreal Fellows, so they were chosen uh, within the last... This was... Uh, Gabby, when were you in it? Was that last uh, summer? In the summer? Yeah, the summer Yeah, last one. summer. And Nick, were you in the same cohort as Gabby? I was in the same cohort, yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, so why don't you guys talk a little bit about that and how that informed you all to use in, in terms of using Unreal in general for this linear media creation? So that'd be a nice thing to talk about for a sec. Sure. Um, yeah, actually, in terms I, of your just, journey with the Unreal Fellowship, yeah, and like how how Faceware technology allowed you to actually have a film that had performance in it, and you know that was a large part of the story, opposed to just a silent film, if you will, which is a lot of what we see. Yeah, I mean, I think Gabby's is 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 better than mine, but I, I'll so I'll start and let her to be the finale on this conversation. Um, and I just thought I'd add that I saw a comment go by in Twitch uh, comments about, you know, how old are these people? And, and you know, I'm 30 and I'm starting late and is it still, is it too late for me to learn? Um, so I'll, I'll share, I'll throw myself on that grenade because there was a question about, you know, what the ages of the panelists are. So I'll take that one and, and I am, I am over 50. And uh, the fellowship, last year was really my first opportunity to genuinely learn animation in Unreal Engine. I had heard of Unreal Engine and virtual production really from my students. Um, I had students in 2019 doing virtual production, uh, seen, you know, graduation projects and uh, started to dabble in it and mostly used it for this, you know, virtual production video, green screening sets sort of thing. Um, but it was going into last year's fellowship that I was learning animation in Unreal Engine for the first time. And MetaHumans had been released. And what was really interesting is that even the fellowship education team were really trying to keep everybody reined in in terms of what the scope, how many different things were you going to put into your short film? You've got five weeks to make this film. You're on your own. Good luck with that. And I went into the fellowship ship thinking in my head that I am going to learn how to animate metahumans, period. And so I had three lead characters that were metahumans and there was dialogue from all of them. And all the the instructors are like, you know, we're gonna help you every step of the way, but you're nuts. <laughs> That's a, a heavy load to lift. Um, but I knew in my back pocket, I actually, I had Faceware. I, I had um, used Faceware's earlier tools, Analyzer and Retargeter prior to the fellowship. So I was familiar with the technology. And to me, having 
Faceware Studio available and having MetaHumans in place, it, it just felt like this is the opportunity for me to really push myself. I have direct access to folks at Epic that I can ask questions of as I'm struggling and fumbling through it. And, you know, in the end, I was able to put that film together and I learned a ton. And yes, I was already 50 then. So, um, so really, I think that the, this is kind of like a dessert first way of learning things like learning the, the end goal of like creating a film and, you know, not worrying about the nitty gritty of how do you do each and every texture yourself and every model and every blend shape and every rig, you know, learn how to use all of these things that already exist. And then as you want to customize that, you can learn each little path through like, all right, you know, I, I want to customize the clothing a little bit more, or I want to customize the hair. Um, you know, you can start digging down deeper from that surface level. And so it becomes very, very accessible. So anyway, there, hopefully I'm addressing yep. some of the questions in the stream and I'll give it to Gabby because her uh, fellowship film, the, the face animation is far more convincing than mine. Thank you. Um, if anyone's curious to know what the fellowship is, um, last August, uh, they <clears throat> Unreal Engine had this uh, Unreal Engine Fellowship uh, page where you could sign up and essentially what it is is five intense weeks, five, six intense weeks of learning the engine, like learning a general overview of the engine. So from A to Z and you have the Epic team teaching you all of these, you know, pro tips and by the time I, I had applied like probably 25 to 30 times. I just kept hitting apply, apply, apply. I really wanted to get in. And then a year later, I actually made it in. So it was incredible. And I had already taught myself how to do most of it. And I took the Winbush course. So I was already like doing everything I could to teach myself. And by having access to the mocap equipment and the software, when you're using higher end equipment and software, you actually learn a lot more. So if anyone's like kind of contemplating about gearing up, Try the soft, the free softwares, like definitely utilize those. And you're going to learn a whole new pipeline you didn't know existed. Live link, the idea of live link is crazy. So the fellowship was great. I actually, I, uh, I begged face where I was like, can I please try your indie head cam? Like I know what an HMC is now. Can I try one? And they sent me the indie head cam and it's a GoPro. So it's literally just the camera stuck to your your helmet and the helmet doesn't move and you just put that rgb data into facewear and then i streamed it into unreal and that's how i kind of modified it and i didn't really have much time to do cleanup and i learned about syncing audio basically not how not to sync audio because I all my audio synced perfectly in Unreal. It was like perfect. And then the moment I rendered it out and I exported it and brought it into Premiere, I didn't know I had to change the frame rates because Premiere was like, oh no, this is 30 frames per second. And I'm like, why is my audio not syncing? So, um, so I learned from the fellowship. And then after the fellowship was over, um, yeah, it's it's been uh, an incredible, incredible experience. But I just want to say one more thing about you, Nick. I recently attended a mocap club meeting that Drexel has, and I would like to say uh, something about all these people, all these students who are feeling like, you know, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to like, you know, get into this industry. And one of your students asked me a question and I'm not going to forget him because I feel like I was him. And, um, I don't know why I'm getting emotional about this, but it really touched me. And he's like, I have a, um, I have a internship where I'm going to go and I'm going to learn like one thing. Should I do the internship or should I take this time off, learn on real and make a film? And I think I told him, I was like, go make that movie, go learn how to create because as an artist, you are not going to learn Unreal unless you have a goal. And my goal is to tell stories. My goal is I want to make films. I want to be like, I kind of want to work with James Cameron. That's kind of my dream. So I have to learn the creative field. I have to learn all of it. And the only way to do that is to fully commit whatever it takes. So it's not easy, but that decision he has to make, I've been there. So I don't know what he decided on doing, but anyone who's considering like, 
Epic Games and Unreal Engine is a job creator. Ever since I learned these new tools, finding a job is like, it, 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 I'll never have to worry about it. So your students are really lucky to have a teacher like you, Nick. They're so lucky, you know? So that's all I got to say. Well, that's, I mean, I, your, your points there are, you know, perfect in the sense of, I think that's really great advice. Take what you want to learn, apply that into a reasonable goal, something that actually will bring value to yourself as an individual. Like I said, you know, I think a lot of us are moving away from shot training, sequence training. We're, we're working on, let's really bring the narrative back into this. Let's make a movie, right? Because if that's, the end, if that's why you're wanting to do this, go, yeah, make that movie. It's going to be infinitely more valuable to you than a demo of just really simple technical work. And that's not to deride or, you know, to toss shade at any just simple technical reel because obviously that's a different job there is a job there for people who want to do just that but if you're coming into it where you're saying like i want to be creatively involved especially as an independent like you're not interested in the studio system you're more wanting to create the content for yourself and express yourself through these methods like there's never been an easier time to do it and you you know since we're all in one program too you know, I, I definitely want to stress this as, as somebody who's, you know, is also a filmmaker without, you know, by being all these other things too. It's the idea that, you know, I think that on the interactive side of things, I see this a lot because I teach uh, intro to interactive as well. And my students are always in that class for some reason, very hesitant to uh, use pre-existing materials because of the asset flip term that gets tossed around. But for linear media, you know, coming at it as a filmmaker, it's like nobody has ever asked me for any of the projects I've done, whether it's been personal projects or commercial projects that I've been a director on, nobody's ever asked me like, hey, Deepak, did you build that Toyota by hand? Or did you do that person's wardrobe and hair? I mean, that's not even ever in the in, in the equation. Nobody would ever say that out loud. So when we entered this world of, you know, where all these assets exist and all this software exists and all these pre-existing pipelines exist, there's a level of humility that I think we could all deserve to have by just not taking that for granted and being like, yeah, you know, Gabby, to sort of what you're saying and Nick, and, you know, I'd love to hear more from Jackson Simon about this idea too, where it's like, you know, if you're in a studio and people are creating the assets for you, that's one thing right? And then you're integrating those assets. If you're alone, you're an individual, you have to figure out what is your time worth, right? Because like I, I, I run into that a lot as an individual uh, filmmaker because I, I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. And I know what I'm never going to waste my time on. One of those things is character creation, right? And another one of those things is pipeline for facial performance capture. So the idea that metahumans exist with faceware really changes somebody's like mine's like entire perspective in terms of what I can do because I no longer have to worry about creating a character, getting it rigged, getting it set up that, that, that exists for me to begin with. So now I can focus on the things that I like, like environment, camera lights, you know, the things that I actually specialize in. And, you know, I think that that is, that is super important because it essentially allows you to understand also you get to sort of figure out what your, what your worth is as an individual. And, uh, this is what I'd pose to Simon and Jax is a question is, do you see more people starting to like enter the industry and whether it's related to facial performance capture or not, I think this is just an overall question that we can pose and, you know, just try to answer having a little bit more, uh, spread out knowledge. Like I don't want to use the word generalist, but they might come to the studio knowing multiple different things, uh, opposed to just one razor sharp focus. That's, that's sort of a question. I have. We can ask Jax first. Like if you're, if yeah. you're starting to notice stuff like that. Yeah. So I always on the side of um, focusing on one area because mm -hmm. that's the only, for me, that's the only way that can uh, get to polish and perfect things. Uh, I know yeah. a lot of students, they all always try to um, make a short film by one, one people, one person. Um, yeah. uh, I'm okay with that. That's some talent can do that. But um, the, the, the most important thing is about storytelling. It's not about, uh, yep. you can do many things. So if you can tell a very touching story or very entertaining story um, that bring joy to the community, right? So uh, there's a lot of free stuff on online. Uh, when you use it, it doesn't mean you steal it, right? There's, uh, because right. it's free stuff, yep. you give credits to the creators and uh, become a collaborative project that makes everyone happy. So if this film become famous and all the other people that the things you, you take from, then they get the credit too. 
So it's a win-win situation for me. So I always uh, agree that uh, it's a collaborative project. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, Simon, do you have anything sort of to speak on in regards to that? Sort of that difference? Yeah. Because I know you've been, you have a good way of doing it because you, you work on your own short films as well. So... Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. It's that uh, in in um, big companies or big teams, a lot of times we're, we're, we find ourselves specializing in order to be the best at this one craft or this, uh, you know, whatever skill that, that we have. We try to really just hone in on that one skill. Um, but last summer when I when I wanted to jump on the MetaHumans bandwagon, I kind of, you know, explored what it was like and I wanted to make a short film because deep down, I think we're all storytellers and we all want to, we, we all want to share what's in our mind and, and, but then there's the restrictions and the reality of like, okay, how much time do I have? Am I really going to do this all by myself? And what assets do I need? And so when I started planning my, my own short film, uh, I started you know, thinking realistically, how am I going to do this? And it was very humbling in the sense of you have to acknowledge the things that you don't know. And that's when you start realizing that there are all these assets out there and there's all these resources and these tutorials. And uh, even even with my years of experience, I, it, I didn't mind to sit down and watch an hour tutorial that I found on YouTube. Like it's I find that very, very humbling that accepting that you you don't know everything, even in this one craft that you think you're you're only good at this one thing. There's still so much room to grow. Um, and so, so I, I really like what Jax was saying about uh, giving credit to the asset, to the developers and the artists uh, that that uh, are willing to share with the community in order for us all to be able to uh, have a have a a bit of a head start on our short projects. So and and to talk more about the, the performance side of things, you know, we we all have friends that don't mind being in front of a camera and and goofing around and. So, so for me, you know, under the conditions that we were in the last year, uh, it was kind of fun to direct a shoot from home. So we all set up our head cams, uh, our, not head cams, awesome. sorry, like a, like on a tripod with a webcam, and we all shot and and uh, and and produced a short film like that as a collaborative effort. So I'm saying that it doesn't always need a mocap suit. It doesn't always need a big fancy mocap stage. Uh, and all these things that that uh, a lot of AAA studios can offer. I, it, for me, it was a way to kind of ground myself because after so many years working in, in big teams, it, it kind of made me feel what what indie developers and um, and and sort of startup. I don't know, not even a studio, but a team feels like when they get started. Cool. Well, you know, I think another thing a lot of people are probably thinking of when when specifically related to Faceware. And, you know, we, like I said, we're going to be releasing this learning content uh, throughout the year. So, you know, every, every, every couple months, you'll get a new course that can sort of take you further and further and further. And hopefully we'll come culminate in a, a, a live streaming MetaHuman uh, course, which is, which is something we're very, very excited about. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask, just in, we'll take it back to Faceware and, you know, what they're doing over there is, um, in, in regards, and we don't need to mention names here, obviously, but there are a lot of different options out there outside of Faceware. And we, we don't want to make it seem like Faceware is your only option. Faceware is what we're here to talk about today. It's what we're utilizing. It's what I've chosen to produce courses on because I think it's the most democratized right now. Um, but can you give me a little bit of insight? You know, anybody who wants to pick this up uh, can in terms of functionally, just like on, you know, functionally how it works. Is is this is this similar? Is it same to a lot of the other systems out there? What makes it different to you, especially with the with the Unreal uh, integration, I should say? Um, is it just ease of access or is it actually more feature rich? Uh, so, Nick, if, if you want to talk a little bit about your experience, because I know you, you probably have experience with other other softwares as well. Um, what what sort of drove you to using this specifically for real time in Unreal? Oh, I think you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so I think it has a really great mix in terms of it's very easy to get started using uh, right off the bat. You know, there's essentially uh, once you have video in that, which can be a live video from a webcam, so you can run this on a laptop, um, or it could be any video file. Once you have that in there, there's a button that calibrates, and at that point it's tracking data. So there's there's very little setup that you can also use uh, just 
as Simon was mentioning, a camera that's on a tripod. You don't necessarily need the head-mounted camera system, but it has you know a button for using a head-mounted camera system if you do have one of those. So it's really easy to get up and running, but at the same time, it has some other more powerful features under the hood that that are covered in the the faceware course that that we already released earlier a couple of weeks ago. Uh, for example, if the way that the data is responding to a specific actor actress um, isn't quite the way you would like it, you can actually get in and, and write a little Python expression, a little bit of math code to alter exactly how that data is being. Uh, translated from the actor's performance to the data that ends up driving your 3D model. And so it has uh, those powerful features for anyone who really wants to kind of be power user and dig in a little bit deeper, uh, but it's really easy to get started very quickly. And then the other piece for me is that a lot of solutions either handle video files only or live video. And Facebook handles both. So uh, you can you can experiment and drive with a live camera sitting on your desk, or uh, if you want to record video, you can use it. And the recorded video opens up a whole nother uh, area that can add accuracy to your um, performances in that you could shoot video at something like 120 frames a second, 240 frames a second, and get this really nice slow motion, all the fidelity of all the movements in the face. And Facebook will track that if you play it back at 30 frames a second, all in slow motion. And so all of that data can be captured in Unreal directly, and then you can begin manipulating it in Unreal Engine. And in Unreal, it's, it's a right-click properties, play that back at 8 X speed, and now you've got it playing back real time, but you've got all that extra fidelity. So, you know, for my um, fellowship film, I had one actor who lived 3,000 miles away from me. We got connected on a Zoom call. He recorded video in his home, just, you know, looking into his camera, sent me that file, but I was able to direct him directly over Zoom, which is essentially what Simon was describing as well of, you know, people just getting together and, um, you know, working remotely to put together a film. One of the experiments I want to do, by the way, is try, there's a tool called Zoom ISO that will extract the individual live feeds of Zoom participants into an NDI feed, which is a network-based video protocol, and Faceware supports NDI input. So um, I could basically set up a Zoom call and have multiple individuals in a Zoom call, each of them driving another metahuman if I have enough computers running faceware. So uh, so I think there's a That's lot of awesome. exciting things that can be done combined with this ease of use um, way of getting started. Cool. Well, that's, yeah, no, I mean, these are all the things that, I mean, as far as we're concerned with learning, it, it just makes it such a no brainer that, that this would be what we get started on. Um, you know, there's a couple of differences. Uh, and Simon, if you want to talk to, you know, as we're, we're talking about the software, like our course starts with using Faceware Studio, which is what we've talked about so far. There's some other, uh, there's some other applications that can be useful, especially for pre-recorded footage, uh, because while Studio will take in live media as well as pre-recorded media, Analyzer and Retargeted or Retargeter are going to work with uh, other pieces of pre-existing media. So Simon, if you could just give us like a little bit of a rundown to why you might use one over the other. Other. Like why you might use Faceware Studio, like oh, you know, over Analyzer Retargeter workflow, or why you might use Analyzer Retargeter workflow over Studio, or maybe you're just like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Like whatever you want to tell us in regards to that. No, so I've I started learning on the Analyzer Retargeter um, pipeline on, on that workflow. I didn't know too much about Faceware Studio until I actually watched Nick's course and realized how amazing and powerful it is. Um, the the reason I would st I would recommend an analyzer and retargeter pipeline is for volume. I really think it comes down to that where uh, you can train um, analyzer on an actor's facial ROM, like his range of motion, and build a, a library of expressions that the performer can do. 
and then apply that as a set of, of poses on a character rig. And so that's um, binding true one-to-one -one with this given performer for that given character. Whereas Facer Studio has sort of an approximative uh, transfer of the performance. And you can there's a lot of calibration that you can do in Face for Studio. But if you're willing to put in the time of training analyzer on how a, face, uh, a performer's face moves, and applying that on and, and really training how the rig should behave with that performance. You pair those together and then you can batch process uh, hundreds if not thousands of lines of animation. And then that's your starting point. And that gives you about, I'd say about 70% of your final quality animation. So that's great for medium shots. You, ne you might never need to polish those. Uh, and anything that's sort of mid to close up, you, you can basically go in to that specific performance and um, Add, add new poses or, you know, really the fine detail like teeth and lip contacts. And so I really think that's where the, the, the major difference comes in is, is really down to volume. Um, and Analyzer tends to pick up a lot more detail because it's offline, uh, as opposed to trying to, yeah. to process all this data in real time. So it really comes down to just that, that baseline. Uh, but what you do with it afterwards is really, I found that Nick's course, the, the last portion of the Nick's course, really dives into how do you how do you polish, how do you layer, how do you customize your animation after the fact. And that part is almost identical whether you started with Facebook Studio or with the analyzer and retarget portion. So I think it's it's mostly um, getting that fidelity of your performance and, and just scaling it up. I think that's where the big difference comes down. That's awesome. I mean, and I, I think, you know, it's glad, it's great that there's there's options out there, the online and offline versions uh, in regards to synchronous or non-synchronous, I should say, I guess, going into the engine. Um, so, Jax, I have a question for you just in regards to, you know, the specific work you're doing at ILM X Lab, which is a lot of XR work, you know, the VR stuff like that we can see mm -hmm. on Oculus and everything, Vader Immortal, et cetera. Like, what is what are, what is different in terms of a, in terms of per, of a performance consideration on y'all's end when you see you know our the character can with the headset on can be two inches away from the performance they could be so it's not yeah. just about mediums close ups wides anymore it's much more immediate it's much you know obviously the ability to have those performances feel more real without any sort of uncanny valley is probably the utmost consideration right like that would be the ultimate yeah. goal. Does this sort of pipeline and this sort of workflow allow you to get there a little bit faster? Or what, what does it sort of do to, or how does it influence the way that you tell these stories in a medium like, you know, XR or VR that is mm -hmm. inherently a more individualized one-on-one -on -one experience with a narrative? Yeah, so uh, I did use a other software before uh, that is audio-based mm -hmm. by the waveform that can create facial. Um, that one, uh, actually we can, we can look closer. <laughs> that would look really sure. like, choppy. That's why we um, saw Faceware. Actually, I was inspired by the uh, Benjamin Button videos that from Faceware okay. at that time. Okay, whoa, that's a good, very awesome quality of facial. And then um, for the VR experience, uh, because uh, when we developed the video model, uh, we have a uh, we have to man carefully managing the to handle the limitation of VR uh, hardware, right? right? Uh, the, although the Darth Vader and Stormtrooper, they do look very cool with their helmets. Uh, but in the VR, you don't want to look at helmets all the time. You need to look at some human, some eyes movement that you get um, engaged with the sympathy, right? So we ended up deciding to um, use the um, facial animation. But with the limitation, uh, we end up, uh, we want the eyes movement, nose movement, cheeks movement, except the mouth. Because we, uh, okay. we a little bit worry about at that time, the lips require too many uh, joints, and then sure. it will affect the VR performance um, at the frame rate that needs to be at 90 frames per second per eye at that time. Yeah. So uh, we that's why we specific um, designed a character that is all everyone everyone at least have a a mask uh, instead of a helmet have a mask. We, sure. When the character talk or look at you and still moving, uh, some of the muscle that looks lively. Um, yeah, that's the our, that's our solution, um, and for sure that Faceware actually give us um, we save time, save cost um, to produce that much uh, animation, and then uh, we we use LOD. So when okay. the uh, yeah when when the player is really close to the character and uh, we play a LD zero like high uh, high res um, character. Yep. Uh, and then and then for the father's one, we use like LD three. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, for some character, 
the background background character maybe we just we didn't uh, polish that much. We just use the direct data from Facebook. Because you know that the, the yeah. yeah the person will never get close enough to see what's going on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I think mean, that's yeah, actually that's, yeah. I I think that would actually be a really good point to kind of uh, jump off into some of the more specific project stuff too. Since you were just talking about the Vader Immortal stuff specifically, I'd really love to dive a little bit further into some of that project as well. Mm -hmm. So can we take a look at the trailer? Finally found his candidate. And our future is in your hands. Vida is here. You are the one I've been searching for. Do as I command. Is there any version of this plan that doesn't end up with us being dead? Show the um, the picture. Can we show the there's, there are three characters that use uh, facewear, which is the um, the left one is called Violet, and then the middle one is called Mustafarian Priestess, and the right one is called Emerio Carius. Uh, you can see that all has a mask. <laughs> uh, this is pre that uh, pandemic <laughs> that time we created. <laughs> so <laughs> very timely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the the reason is because we want some life, but we uh, um, because of hardware limitation, uh, so we use this design. Um, but the it's all face wear, and actually it's all by me, by, by myself using my iPhone. <laughs> so wow, that's uh, incredible. We have blinking, we have talking, yeah. And then I mean, I can, you know, um, what's, what I love, mm -hmm. oh, it's mm -hmm. just the idea, like you said, it's like you're working within the limitations, right? Because you knew yeah. that you might not have the resources for the full on lip sync. So you've you've solved that creatively, and nobody's ever questioning that because I've played all of these, but I've played all the episodes. Like I've never I've never thought like, oh, why are their faces covered? I, and I've that's never been in a barrier to me emotionally connecting with anything going on, which is so cool. Hmm. And then um, I can show you a um, video capture of myself um, on Facebook. I can Vilip Fulma, show that. Lore master of my cavern clan. Vilip Fulma. Cool. Yeah. So just for the audience like, clarification, yeah. yeah. That's what you used, mm. right? That's literally yeah, what that's... you used to analyze. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I use the actor uh, voice, but uh, use my own face. <laughs> uh, one of the thing I like for face wear is the pruning, uh, pruning, uh, what is it? How to say the pruning, uh, pruning spacing, pruning and spacing, smoothing. yeah, and smoothing uh, cat uh, category. So that one let me because if we directly capture our face, actually, we have a lot of jewelry, we have a lot of movement, movement, right? When you look when I'm transferring to the character, 
you will see the character move too much sometimes. So the pruning actually can take out the percentage of uh, the entire facial animation, make it look smoother. And also um, easier, just I change it by changing percentage, I can get a smoother uh, facial that fit into the alien uh, uh, head or alien face. So that's, that's the one of the things that I really like. Yeah, I mean, the end product of that was absolutely incredible. And I could absolutely see what you were talking about, where being able to see, uh, you know, like the cheek movement and the eyebrow movement, it still really brought that emotion to life, even without being able to actually see the lips and the mouth. It's just incredible how that was able to come together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think, too, just vein. from the... Oh, yeah, go ahead, Tina. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, in a similar vein, I know that we also had some of the work that Simon was doing as well, which some of that's pretty related as well, if we want to be able to dive into some of those too. Uh, I'd probably start with the uh, performance capture behind the scenes, uh, just to kind of show like the capture process of what it was like to have all the actors performing together. Uh, that one doesn't really need audio. I think we could kind of talk over it while it's, uh, while it's playing. This is actually a video that just came out last week where we get to see the performers from our game uh, acting together. That's actually me like setting up a helmet cam and um, and the monitors on which we were tracking the facial performance. So um, what else can I say? It, it was really one of the greatest things about having all the actors acting off of each other is that the chemistry between the these characters was so important. Uh, compared to if they were all recorded in, in separate booths or uh, even from home, I think we wouldn't have had necessarily that same dynamic. So even even under uh, the restrictions of the last year, we were able to complete the project uh, with um, very specific guidelines, you know, the number of people we could have on set, uh, masking, uh, social distancing, hand sanitizer, all the whole thing. But like we were able to continue shooting uh, in our in-house studio. That's another big advantage is that for turnaround from capture to animation data, we were all often within uh, you know 48 hours before we can actually have our first versions of our animations in uh, in our game. So that that was really remarkable. Um, so after this video, we can show the facial reel, which is um, kind of a sample of what the facial performance looks like when it's applied onto our characters. I'm not sure if we have audio on this one. Can we? <laughs> if we don't have audio, that's okay. I could talk over it. Um, so on the on the right, we have a preview of what those uh, helmet cam footage looks like and how we applied it. So these are our cinematics. So obviously, these were um, uh, adjusted both in a technical pass to make sure that we have the accuracy of the lips, but we can also accentuate certain expressions and even hold uh, for comedic timing or specific things like that. This One is of the great just things. incredible, <laughs> actually watching it in live time. <laughs> yeah. I love being able to literally see, you know, the actual actor and how it's being translated onto the characters. It's just great being able to see the process and what the end result was from it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the great things about this project is that it had such a lo uh, such a wide range of emotions. We had some very comedic moments, but we also had some very heartfelt moments. And so to be able to uh, have the performers really stretch their, their performance skills and, and have us applying that onto the characters was really a gem. Um, and and from from the reaction that we've been getting from the game, it, it really takes you on a roller coaster. Uh, and, and I'm super happy that uh, that it's that it's connecting with the players. Yeah, I mean, it's basically at that point, the perfect blend between a created experience while still being able to get the full spectrum of the talent from the actors as well and getting all of the emotion and the hard work that they're putting into it, but being able to actually translate it directly into a project, a virtual project is absolutely mind blowing. And it's so much fun also just from a consumer standpoint, being able to actually get that full spectrum. Yeah.
And I, I also want to bring it back to all the topics that we've been bringing is that this is the way that like maybe AAA studios are scaling, but there's so many elements from this that can be brought back into like uh, home projects and indie developers. And and the goal, like we, I, I was saying earlier, that it's all about just telling a story. So, you know, the, which performers you work with, which assets, and it's it's about working within the scope of your your capabilities and then building on that as you gain more experience. Yeah, yeah that's, just... I, it's so cool. Like just seeing this stuff and seeing the diversity of all the different projects too. And I think one thing that I'm seeing a lot in the chat is people sort of questioning whether or not this is indie. I, I would say if you're questioning that, you know, check out the price points and then check out the price point of anything else. Um, an iPhone's more expensive than a DSLR, right? We might all have iPhones, but I mean, you can get a DSLR that'll give you a 1080p, 60 frame per second uh, video recording that you can use live or offline with an $85 HDMI adapter into your video card uh, to get the signal in. So I think when when we when we talk about this this process, this hardware, this software being democratized, there's very clearly going to be a distinction between studio level work. But I think what a lot of people on this panel have done here and, you know, their work will speak for themselves is they've utilized indie techniques within the studio level. Um, so, yes, they might have they might have more resources in terms of the assets and characters and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, Jax was showing us footage that he shot on his iPhone to animate something in an official Star Wars project released on Oculus from ILMX Lab. Like, if, if that's not democratization of the, the, the technique and the pipeline, I don't know what is. Because, you know, obviously certain aspects of this are free, like Unreal, like what we're providing at Epic. But other things, you know, it's a business. People have to make a money. Not, not everything can be just put out there. There are open source ways to do this, of course. I mean, but that's the time. That's the time versus money thing that I think we all have to have that internal conversation at least with ourselves we're talking about like okay like well you know i'm not an asset creator i'm working on a film right now with the space shuttle was it worth it for me to you know i i can do hard surface modeling but i found one online that was a couple hundred bucks like that's worth my time to just save up the money and buy that than it is to take six months out of my life i'm not a modeler i'm a filmmaker i don't want to get do that deep a dive into model making or even if i know the basics so i i think we really once again it's about not taking this done it wherever it's coming from because this is now available and i think people's like, like gabby's story really speaks to that i think even the stuff that jackson and simon are doing at a studio when when we're still talking about these concepts being out there and you know existing and the learning material especially uh you know all everything that we're talking about today, by the way, I want to make this clear is somebody who, you know, is producing this content for Epic. We are we are not doing anything to where there's not a free version for you to try. So even with Faceware, there is a free trial that is unrestricted. There's no watermark, nothing. You can just download it and try it. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. You can even download it, make a movie within those 30 days that you have and pay nothing. You know, so I, I really think when we, we need to look at this as an opportunity um, as creators, because you might download it, you might try it out and you might basically just say like, look, I don't, it's not for me. And you, you would continue to do what you're doing. You can hire out people to do this part of it for you. But I think what we have to realize, and I mean, I'm, I'm coming this from a very personal space where, you know, my goal as a, as a kid was to be a filmmaker. I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I was, I was not that into uh, the, meat, the nuts and bolts of technology, though. So where, where I came to this was I got my undergrad degree in filmmaking. I got my uh, graduate degree in filmmaking. And when I was in grad school, I decided I wanted to get into technology. Um, I had stints in visual effects before. That was literally just to pay the bills, but I was always interested at a certain point in the combination of technology and storytelling, and that sort of driven my career. What I have never seen before in, you know, literally 12 years, almost 15 years since starting, do, starting to do this is how accessible all of this stuff has been. So the short that I'm working on right now, like it is utilizing technology that literally did not exist, <laughs> democratized or, you know, available readily available six months ago and most of that is being provided by epic some of it has been provided by faceware and of course there's a there's a lot of other you know third-party uh softwares uh that we can use so i think you know reiterating that point that you know while while things might still cost something they're the lowest they've ever cost before the barrier to entry on a financial level 
is the lowest it's ever been, which means, you know, if we look at a graph, then inversely, the amount of ambition you can have as a creator going into a project, you know, sky's the limit. Or let's say, you know, the stars are the limit, you know. It's, it's, it's a completely different world we live in now in terms of how this technology is out there, how it's being distributed, how people like me are creating learning content for it, not only at academic institutions, but, you know, for online uh, platforms such as Epic's online learning. But then as you can see with the sort of the diaspora of people we have here that represent different aspects of individual creativity in the industry, you know, we're all using the same thing. So once again, I would like to you just point to that. It's like, it's not like everyone here in these windows are using different softwares that it's like sort of a unifier here when we talk about how we're utilizing this tech. And to me, that that's a sign that we're moving towards more democratization. If a studio is using it and me at home on my, you know, consumer PC is using it, like we're at feature parity to a degree in ways that we've never been before. So I just definitely want to make that point and put that out there. Yeah. 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 I think it's um, a really good point. Yeah. One point to add, um, the, uh, it's not about, uh, it's not, you don't need to use iPhone for sure. Any phone, okay. Any phone yep. you can use. And then, uh, even a webcam and just click a record from your screen that works. So the key is, um, uh, you need to capture, uh, in a good lighting environment. So you, we don't want uh, motion blur. So motion blur when do the analyze, it, it will, uh, you need, you need more time to do the analyzer, but if you have a, a good lighting, you can capture at 60 frames per second. And then you, uh, downgrade to 30 frames, you get less motion blur that helps. So any phone can do. And Tina, yeah, I yeah. think unless we were going to move to Q and A, there is one thing that I definitely like to hit on with everybody here is like, are there any immediate tips and tricks like that, that you'd want to make sure we get on the record like gabby i know you said you and nick mentioned the frame rate thing is there anything else that anybody would want to say that is like a, an essential thing that you only learned while going through this process that you maybe have never seen never seen documented anywhere but it's something you definitely want to get out there and make sure that people know because i think Jax, you've probably given yours which is the motion blur thing i think that's fantastic uh gabby is there anything you want that anything that you've discovered where you're like i wish i had known this like a year, you know, six months ago when I started or a year ago when I started? Um, I would say instead of thinking about doing it, just do it. That's it. Like, you're going to make mistakes. Awesome. Just do it. Yeah. You're going to hit walls. There's a whole community on Discord and everywhere you go. Just do it. That's it. Try it. Nick, what about you? Oh, muted, I think. Uh, so many buttons so close together. Uh, make sure you know which button you're pushing and when you're pushing it. That's that's a good <laughs> good tip to know. Um, yeah, I, you know, the tips you're getting are really good. I think one of the things that um, I was really impressed with, specific to this faceware workflow, is that the motion logic folder that's in Unreal Engine has an individual response curve for each and every essentially facial muscle on the metahuman and in the course that that already came out i kind of demo where you can go in there i was floored by how much you could transform the performance with that and those curves impact live uh, data coming in from faceware as well as any data that you're recording and so i would definitely take a, a look at those because if you're if you're seeing an expression in your performer and it's not really coming through on the metahuman uh those curves it behaves just like curves in photoshop in terms of how you can adjust the response of you know black to white uh in photoshop you can actually alter the response of uh, a data stream and it's directly in unreal engine so it works in real time and uh i, I would definitely look into that because that that really has transformed how some of the uh processing has been for me. And then um, the only other thing is I've, I've done a few projects now that have involved uh, remote uh, performers. Uh, Eric Beer is in, Bear is in here and, and, and we've been doing some remote work and it really does help if, if you're going to do a, uh, a genuine production. It helps to have some folks at the remote site that are, you know, monitoring the hardware 
and taking care of the recording of the data and things like that uh, so that the performer and the director on either end of the um, remote connection can really just focus on, well, directing and performing. So those are my two tips. Great. Simon, what do you got for us? Uh, I want to bounce off of what Gabby was saying that ju just do it, just give it a try. You never know what you're going to learn. Uh, but I want to add on top of that to ask, don't think that you're alone in this, that anybody who's getting started that thinks it's a, it's a mountain they have to climb, they're not by themselves. There's a huge community and, and Gabby mentioned the Facebook Discord as well, that there are places where we can answer qu uh, questions and things like that. Um, more on the technical side, uh, I mentioned the facial ROM, the range of motion. That's something that I didn't use at the beginning of my project. And so when you're calibrating your character to your performer, a ROM will save you so much time and hassle. That's definitely um, uh, something that I would recommend. And then experimenting with the ROM is something that you could do by yourself, record your, your own face, and then try to apply that onto a character. And then once you work with another performer, you basically already have that experience that you could build on it. Um, and that, that applies for both face for studio and analyzer because even in studio when you're adjusting your, your parameters and everything like that you can you could customize it to your given character because every face is different whether it's the performer or the character rig so you want to make sure that those two things uh, match before you get started so that would probably be I, I had another one but i forgot it maybe i'll come back so i'll pass it on to jacks uh yeah i really talk about it right <laughs> Yeah, and I think, yeah, yours is great. Um, I think, you know, one thing that I've noticed with people getting started from an education point of view is um, they, they do a lot of tests. They'll, they'll start doing tests. They'll start capturing footage, bringing it in. Um, if your end goal, and this is what I would just say is an observation, if your end goal is to be a filmmaker and use this for filmmaking, make sure that when you present your material, it is filmic and cinematic. Start learning from the beginning how to bring lights in, light your character, create a sense of place and environment. Because one thing that I see a lot is just people doing it in like the third person example map. And like, you know, that's okay. But at the same time, it's like, use these skills in parallel with what your actual goal is. Uh, because it's gonna be that much more interesting. Like for example, if you have an evenly lit character outside in the third person example map, by definition, that's not cinematic. You know, and that maybe is what's causing the uncanny valley in something that you're presenting, right? It's it's not going to have that extra care for, you know, cinematic realism. So one of the things I would suggest is definitely check out all the free projects that we have on the marketplace in the learning examples and start tossing your live performances into a mega scans level or something. You know, even if your computer can't run it live, you can still do a movie render queue output and see that character in a scene that's already pre-lit for you and start doing stuff with your camera angles. Because one thing we'll also notice too, and you can watch any movie, television show, cutscene in a video game, is the camera in many cases, I don't want a blanket statement this, is not always in a close up, right? And so that is also an important thing to learn when you're analyzing your footage. Simon said this before, in a mid shot, medium shot, definitely an OTS over the shoulder, you're not going to have to spend a lot of time fixing anything. You might literally just see the corners of the mouth moving or maybe the side of the face, right? So understanding too, if you have a project, a script that you're working on, something that you're working towards, you know, you need to learn this the best way you can to be able to tell your story. You do not have to be this genius that can pop open faceware and unreal and get every single piece of dialogue correctly lip synced with the right emotion. Because unless your movie is just a fixed camera in front of someone, and not to say they can't be, I've seen a couple of these actually, believe it or not, where you know it's a one shot, one take, Ryan Reynolds buried type situation. I think that wasn't one take, but you know what I mean? Like just right here, You'll never have to do that. So it's a waste of your time, honestly, other than potentially practice. But why don't you practice on things you're actually going to include inside of your film? So that would be definitely my tip is, you know, when you have a performance end to end, edit it before you actually go in and realize what you're going to use. Because, you know, I you might have a three minute take. Is the camera really showing somebody's face for all three minutes? Do you really need to process all three minutes of that shot? and manually do all the lip sync? Probably not, right? So having that level of understanding and control over your idea and how you want to represent your idea with camera angles and the edit is really going to help you quite a bit and make this process a lot less painful. 
trust me. <laughs> like that. So I'll definitely put that out there. Yeah, just on the same point, you're just talking about scoping, uh, because a yeah. lot of times when we start these personal projects, we get very ambitious. And uh, before you know it, this this project that's, that was such a, you know, close to your heart ends up being this thing that you hate. So I would say, like, keep it, keep it short, keep it small as a starting point to make it realistic, because, uh, yeah, you, you're not going to end up finishing it if it's too big. <laughs> Speaking well, and to that point, too. Yeah, <laughs> it's like. If you have scope creep, if it gets more ambitious, the thing that you need to do is just have a very realistic conversation with yourself so that every time you move the goalposts, you are not getting upset and you are not you, because you'll know it's a process uh, that that because that definitely 100 percent happens. Yeah. Totally. I'm pretty sure it's basically become a mantra on this show that yeah. <laughs> the crux of all developers is scope. <laughs> Always. Yeah. But yeah, I think this would be a good time to move over into Q&A. But before we hop into that, there was a video that Gabby brought us that I would like to bring up if you'd yeah. like to talk a little bit about that as well. Hi, I'm Gabriella and I go by Feeding Wolves. How do I animate my MetaHuman faces? With Facewear. I have been using Facewear with MetaHumans since their release. I first started out with Facewear and MetaHumans using DSLR footage of my face. All I have to do is calibrate a neutral expression, then activate stream to client, in Unreal assign the motion logic blueprint to my MetaHuman's face, and enable either the live client plugin or free Facewear live plugin, and I can see my MetaHuman come to life instantly. I can make adjustments in Facewear so that my MetaHuman's expressions match mine as close as possible. I have also had the opportunity to test out the Indie HMC by Facewear. This was the first time I ever used a head-mounted camera. Now I'm currently using the Mark IV HMC by Facewear in order to see how far I can push the level of quality with MetaHumans and facial motion. This gives me more control over my lighting, framing my face, and I'm also able to stream in my face data along with my body and finger data easily. What I love is that I'm able to see my performance in real time and I'm also able to record this body and facial performance directly in the softwares as well as in Unreal. This makes syncing audio with the face and body performance extremely easy. This also speeds up my sequencer workflow and makes fine-tuning with Control Rig much more precise, especially when working with dialogue. If you'd like to know more about my MetaHuman motion capture workflow, be sure to check out my upcoming Facewear webinar capture MetaHuman pipeline. You are welcome to check that out next week. And uh, yeah, speaking of, um, there's, I, I'm kind of looking at the, um, the comments that people are posting. And uh, actually, before I answer one of the questions, uh, Nick, you mentioned the motion logic blueprint. And I will say that part of the magic that I didn't have time to put in the video that you just watched is um so the metahumans the way they are created it's absolutely brilliant their expressions are already so natural looking and they have like like over a thousand bones and blend shapes so by utilizing a high-end uh, facial motion solution that is now available to everybody you really get to see some incredible results and in between the raw solver that Facewear has and the MetaHuman pose asset lies that motion logic blueprint. And I have to give a shout out to um, Norman Wang from Glassbox because there's probably only a very small amount of people on this entire planet that can set up a blueprint uh, of that caliber. I saw what he had done with Grace by John McInnes, and it's absolutely incredible that we have this motion logic blueprint working inside of unreal engine letting face were kind of like stream through that so um yeah that is i think the second piece of magic that um people really should kind of like delve into i'd love to talk about that more but um yeah we were talking about uh the tools and how they're accessible to everybody and some of them are like super cheap some of them are not um i will say this since Deepak, you were talking about being a filmmaker. If uh, you are trying to make films, high quality films, or even photorealistic films, any filmmaker will tell you if you've ever tried to rent 
or buy a cinema camera or a body or a lens. We're talking like an insane, the, the, the numbers start to like just go up and then you need a crew and you need this and that. So what I love is that I am, I'm gonna, I think I'm coining this term, a stay at home filmmaker. With all of these tools, I can make films from home, okay? And I, I'm having a ball doing it. I have begged and borrowed to get access to this equipment. And it is, it is an investment, but as someone who wants to make films, I weigh it out as far as like buying an Ari Alexa Mini and buying all these expensive lenses. And like, believe me, the all-in-engine workflow is um, much more accessible. And I'm just really excited to see what this army of indies that is entering this field with no experience, maybe After Effects. I am just, I'm just so excited to see what level of creativity they're going to bring to the table, you know, because studios have like the teams to be able to do it. But I can't wait to see how this is going to make the creative field evolve because now we have more perspectives, you know. So, yeah, I'm very happy. Yeah, I think I think it's a really great point. It brings up a uh, really just like you were saying, it, it makes it more available to indie creators and everything that's accessible. You can bring in a whole lot of other people into this industry that was previously kind of limited, really. You were limited on your options of being able to get into it, to experience it, to get into a position where you could learn it. And now it's not, which is really cool. <laughs> And I think one thing to stress there too is even in the past where there's been brief moments where some of the other softwares have been democratized as well as face as well as what Facewear is doing now, a lot of those softwares then got acquired and shut down. Uh, face Shift being a huge example uh, from before. Uh, but back then, you know, once again, it was not twofold. We had the the pipeline becoming slightly more democratized, but still the metahuman or the equivalent did not exist. And, you know, that is really a missing piece of the pipeline for a lot of people, no matter what their skill level is, no matter which side they fall on, whether they're indies or studios, is that whole process, having that ready-made rig, ready to go, like for, you know, really, really, really engaging emotional performances, um, that was that was a lot more difficult to do. And, and to me, the, the combination of these two things, like being at Epic and also being outside teaching, like I've been able to observe like that, that it's like the, the combination has been the biggest boon uh, for this explosive growth that we've seen uh, with filmmakers, very specifically in, in my experience, the filmmakers uh, getting involved in this technology and getting excited about it, you know. Because, yeah, you, you don't need tens of thousands of dollars of equipment. Yes, you need a computer that's, that can run Unreal and, you know, that spec can vary pretty wildly. Uh, you need something to where if you want to take advantage of metahumans at LOD zero, you got to have a good GPU, right? But other than that, I mean, I'm using, I'm personally using my iPhone. I, I found a parts list on LinkedIn for a helmet, uh, my own helmet build that I used. I spent less than $120 to get that set up. Uh, and it works pretty flawlessly. So, you know, I think for those of you who are out there, filmmakers, the resourcefulness, like the the sort of ambition, all that stuff that you do as a scrappy independent can, can track one-to-one -one into this virtual world too. Uh, I saw a comment on the Discord where somebody was saying as a, as a person who, you know, makes traditional film, like going into the virtual world for virtual filmmaking, they, they've never looked back. I mean, I've got to agree 100%. Any project where I'm, I'm sort of in, encountering a choice, should I do this virtually or should I do this traditionally? That's an actual conversation that I have now. Like I, I will literally put anything that comes across my desk uh, into that sort of binary question is like, should I do this this way or should I do it that way? And sometimes there's overlap and it can, it can be a little bit of both. Um, and hopefully, you know, one day we'll, 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 we'll pop on one of these streams and talk a little bit about that and the hybrid, uh, stuff that you can do. Uh, but using Facebook does not preclude you from any of that sort of stuff you can have, because this can drive also photo real CG characters in a real hybrid VFX, like live action, uh, CGI world too. So this isn't just limited to what we're seeing here and what, what most of the examples we've seen today are in the real, you definitely saw it with some of the work, uh, in Justice League and stuff like that, where obviously that's a live action film. Um, but, you know, this really opens the doors for, for everything in, in that regard.
Yeah, totally. Which I think is also a good time to mention that Facebook now has its Indio, like Indio. Oh my goodness. English is hard. All right. Talking is difficult. Don't let anyone fool you. <laughs> but they have their indie license that is now available, which there are some Facewear folks in the chat. If you have any questions for them directly, feel free to ping them and ask them about it. But the point of the indie license is just to have a annual, uh, I think it's $179 for the annual purchase of it, which is incredible, much more accessible, and is definitely something to look into. So if you're interested in learning more about that, make sure you reach out to the Facewear team and get some more details about that. But with that, I think it's a great time to dive into our Q&A segment, if the guests are open to that. Yeah, I saw a question about Absolutely. me uh, show up the, my videos on the YouTube. Um, that one is not yet. I need to get some... Uh... A permission. I have more actually. I want to show more, but I need to get permission from my uh, from XLab. If I get the, the, that one, I will I will post it on YouTube. So keep an eye out. <laughs> It'll go up probably eventually <laughs> with permission. <laughs> there was a question. Um, pretty much for this, I'm just going to pose the questions to all of you. Anybody who wants to jump in and answer and give it a go, you're more than welcome to. The first one I thought was interesting that we could throw out to you guys is what emotions from actors do you find the most challenging to capture? Sure, Simon, what do you think? Yeah, um, Just sadness. There's a lot of subtle movement that happens when somebody cries. And it's just not something that I, I as somebody who plays a lot of games, I don't see a lot of really like heart wrenching moments and things like that. So it's really something that's that was very interesting to explore. I won't reveal anything regarding Guardians, but there are certain moments that that really tug at the, the heartstrings. And getting to animate on some of the, some of those sequences was something. First of all, I didn't know that I was going to be involved in. I really thought that I was just going to be the guy who builds the pipeline. I didn't think I would actually get to animate uh, much on this project, but I actually got to to get my hands in on some of those animations and. Uh, yeah capturing capturing subtlety and uh, of course then you have the sort of bigger expressions where somebody's just laughing and, and having a great time um that allows for a lot more um i don't want to say stylization because it always depends what the art direction is but it allows for a lot more um f flexibility in, in the expressions and, and blending from one to another it's a lot of fun to play with so so we we were lucky to have that that very wide range yeah, I was wondering about um, some of those slightly more subtle expressions like sadness, like you were saying. So good to know my intuition is on track. <laughs> um, how about anybody else? Any other answers to that? What are some emotions yeah, that I you've thought, had some difficulty with? I totally agree with uh, Simon. It's uh, crying and sadness that is so hard. <laughs> that pesky sadness. I think, I think there's, isn't there a phrase or something like, you know, it takes... 72 muscles or something like that to frown and only two to smile and and you know it, it is that like the these rigs are simulating you know all the the anatomy underneath the face in order to to pull the the mesh around so um so it's not at all surprising yeah i think all, all of those the agony sadness anything where you're really expressing you know the pushing all different muscles in lots of different directions that's going to be far more challenging than just a nice little grin yeah uh, i'm gonna have to absolutely the blinks are really hard the blinks like nailing blinks and um getting them just right those are really tough it's like always for me something super simple but um yeah the blinks are always like the first thing i tackle <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a good point, though, because blinking is definitely something where if it's even just the tiniest bit off, it's really obvious that something is wrong. <laughs> they might not be able to tell right away what it is in particular, but if you have, I don't know, maybe one eye that blinks just a tiny bit faster than the other one, there's that, wait a second, <laughs> what just happened here? <laughs> and then animating the top is really difficult. <laughs> Because like speech requires a lot of tongue movement. So you see like the mouth moving, but you're like, okay, is that an L? What is that? So that that's really hard. 
<laughs> which it's a very fine line between some realistic movement and very uncanny valley <laughs> for sure which yeah, one thing we can definitely yeah well yeah no, to, go ahead, to we'll that be... point though with with the control rig stuff uh, and I know, Nick, you've talked about this, I believe, maybe not on the course, but in another video, it's like you do have the opportunity to really add an asymmetry to the face, which is something that is a huge giveaway if you do not do that in many cases. If everything is perfectly mirrored on your character, um, I have a kind of horrifying story of getting my head 3D scanned uh, and realizing how off my eyes were. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm 36, and I'd never realized that one eye, if I look straight ahead, is slightly, I mean, visibly, on, especially on a 3D model where it's just sort of a clay material, I saw my face and I was like, oh, boy. Um, <laughs> but that, that's something that's true. You know, like one of my eyes is slightly lower than the other. You know, the, the left side of my nose is different than the right in terms of what happens when I do, a, a you know, some sort of move. So being able to add that in really helps with the uncanny valley like I've found and you know, the blink rate too. blink rates, a big thing. Uh, like you sort of said, it's like, you know, if you're blinking exactly at the same time, you'll notice if you're analyzing your performer video, one eyelid might hit a frame before the other. Right. So things like that. And your, your software might not actually catch that because sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, because you haven't recorded 60 frames per second or higher. So then, you know, with, with techniques that Nick teaches in his course, you can go in and do a little change or a little offset. That's a great tie in to one of the other questions we had too was do you guys have any tips or tricks in regards to trying to push something that may be sitting in the uncanny valley at the moment? How can they push that into something that's not so disturbing to look at? <laughs> uh, one thing that I like to do is get into the controls that the um, automation software doesn't actually manipulate. So there are uh, several hundred controls available for, for metahumans. And um, the, the Faceware Studio, and, or actually um, any software, doesn't actually go in and manipulate all of them. So as one example, uh, with the lips, the rig has uh, several controls just for how sticky your lips are and, and how they're making contact to one another. And it's an interesting how much you can change, you know, how a syllable is being shaped just by, you know, having a little bit more stickiness in, in the lips. And that's just one that's not, it's not in the tracking software. It's not manipulated by that. So you can go in there and just, just ed edit that just a little bit and uh, get a, a good bit of difference in, in how that performance is and a little bit of extra human simulation there with just how the lips are sticking together. Uh, I had a piece of advice regarding blinks because you're mentioning that uh, they're difficult to work with. One of the things that I noticed with Analyzer, and I, I can't speak for Facer Studio, but in Analyzer, a lot of times when we blink, the lookouts will dip. You know, like uh, even if you're holding a look at in the direction and you blink, just based on how our, our library is fleshed out, a lot of times it will tend to reset to the eyes to the center and then bring it back when the eyes open. So this is just a bit of a, like a technical animation advice. But so whenever the eyes blink, you could basically delete those animation keys for the look at that kind of constantly resets and that will hold the look at in its position. So just a little trick on how to avoid That's awesome. that. Uh, the eye constantly resetting because that removes a lot of realism in, in the performance. <clears throat> One thing yeah, that I've me, added uh, to, it, <laughs> I would, I'm curious, does anybody, I always have to shave before I do any <laughs> sort of test too. So that might be something that some of y'all encounter for sure. So it's good to know. Have I a, mean, with, yeah, sorry. I was just to um, echo what uh, uh, Deepak had to say is that, you know, face wear is going to track if, if you have face hair, um, you know, that face hair is away from the skin. And, you know, so that's, it is definitely something that can throw off the, the track. So it's, it's yeah. good to be clean shaved for this. We have a trait. We have, we, we have a trait. Uh, we have an actor who has a big beer um, and then you put a rubber band. So we put rubber band, oh. rubber band, then you can track that. Nice. Put a light color, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, cool. 
Speaking of the the eye, uh, I think the Uncanny Valley. Uh, I work at I work on the Christmas Carol with Robert Zemeckis back in the time. It's all like you guys talk about Uncanny mm -hmm. Valley. So we try to solve that problem. Um, so for uh, actually Unreal is really good because we can use the auto tracking. Uh, tracking is important because when the in the game when the characters look at you, uh, that looks lively, right? If one like one second it looks off, like the eyes is look like looking at nothing, they would like lost. Uh, lose the life. So, Unreal help that. For if not Unreal, if we uh, if we use a if we do a pre render, and then we have to make sure uh, we have the eyes always um, engaging to the to the to the character to the camera or something. So it's like always we cannot have some frames that off and then like start doing daydreaming or something like that. Yeah, need a lot of keys on the on the um, eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, and there's another thing with metahuman creation too. Like when you're creating your metahuman, make sure your your eyelid spacing is correct too. Some people will export them, and they will have com they will have like a noticeable amount of space in between the iris and the bottom eyelid, which is very rare for like an actual. That's a good point. Yeah. Being to That's have. a good point. Yeah, and so you so if you don't do things like that, your starting point is incorrect. Right, because that's not necessarily set up automatically in the metahuman creation. So one thing that I do is like, even if I'm making a a character from scratch, I will just pull up, you know, faces. Like, you know, I'll do a Google image search for maybe an actor that I might be modeling some features off of, and I will go sort of, you know, top top to bottom, and just try to be like, hey, give me a little Jake G up here, and a little bit of Ryan Reynolds down here. You know, it's like I'm going through, and I'm just sort of seeing because even if it's a completely bespoke character that will eventually not resemble anybody, I want to basically base all the choices that I'm making when I'm creating my metahuman off sort of like a baseline that is real, uh, if that makes sense. So like that's one of the things I tell my students a lot. I always notice that like right under the iris on the bottom of the iris sometimes they leave too much white space is the default uh and that that will then lead to everything being thrown off just like a little bit so that's yeah that's something i would definitely want to mention all fantastic tips i really hope everybody was taking notes because some of those are some really really great pieces of advice <laughs> that i feel like you probably learned the hard way so <laughs> Another question that was up was actually from a student. They were wondering, did you have any advice for somebody who's a student who's not currently in the industry or even necessarily quite at the point to go into the industry? Do you have any advice for things that they should be looking more into, things that they should be trying to invest into before they take that step in trying to get their first job? So uh, Gabby's yeah, advice about say, just do it is never right. Yeah, you do. Yeah, So the uh, the Un Unreal Engine is um, really penetrating many markets right now in general. So, and, and we're not just talking about entertainment. Of course, it's been in games for for a long time, um, and of course, it's been gaining increasing traction in narrative animation and visual effects and, and virtual production. But it is also um, getting into automotive and fashion and retail. Uh, it's being used in museums and such. So, you know, the, the first thing would be that if you've come from working predominantly in, in Blender and Maya, that's great. You've got a skill set on which to build. Um, spend some time in Unreal Engine and, and get a hang of that as well. Um, you know, inside the film industry, for example, it's being used more and more for pre-visualization. So the movie might get made two or three times before anyone sets uh, foot on set uh, with a, in front of a camera. And all those iterations are being done in Unreal Engine. So a lot of the, um, the, the limitation of how much it gets adopted is based on just the number of people who are skilled with it. So I would definitely start there. And then, you know, start at the surface, you know, the, the marketplace at Unreal Engine is, is something of its own digital backlot. So there's lots of things that are available free. There's lots of things that are inexpensive to acquire. And so you can get started playing with it 
without having to build every single thing yourself. And then as you discover areas that you want to customize more and more that don't quite meet your needs, that's when you can start digging deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, so I would definitely start there and, and tear things apart. I mean, if you download the free MetaHumans and bring it into both Maya and Unreal Engine, there is so much you can learn about rigging uh, any character. Um, the, the Someone was commenting about just how stunned they were at how many joints, how many bones there are in a MetaHuman. Uh, like the one hip, just the right hip alone has something like seven bones. And in most character rigs, they have one right there. Uh, and the face is just bristling with joints. And for metahumans, those joints are used to drive the shape of the character itself, as well as do volumetric adjustments when, you know, when an appendage like an arm gets pulled in really close or a leg gets uh, bent a whole lot. There are joints compensating for the loss of volume in what would normally be something that looks like a candy wrapper bent in half for a CG character. So there's a lot that you can learn by just digging into what is available and, and taking it apart. You could download the free MetaHuman demo and open up all those animation curves. And you could see how, you know, a professional animator worked that MetaHuman rig and all the controls they touched and, and how they shaped their uh, performance curves. And there's just a lot there's just a gold mine of information inside each of these assets that you can download for free. Yeah, which is so valuable, just having the stuff available to start. I think it's some really good advice that you've given of just, just do it. What's the worst that happens, right? It doesn't work out and you try it again until it does work. You know, there's absolutely, I mean, that is keep doing it hundred percent because you know your failures are your own and you learn from them right and you grow from them there's not one person that i've ever met in my life that has not turned a failure into a success in some way or another especially if they continue to go at it and like my personal journey with this is you know i, I self-taught myself unreal around 2014 because I, I sort of saw the writing on the wall with visualization you know once again coming from the practical film background and I've never looked back. And I know so many people who are in the exact same boat. You know, even if they consider themselves a filmmaker or, you know, a practical film person, this has become a tool that's a part of their repertoire now. And it's led to work. Uh, it's led to opportunities for collaboration. Um, just to specifically speak to what a student can do with this, though, it's like, you know, depending on your institution, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to work at a place where even though it's a very traditional film school, they've they've made this a priority uh, to give this skill set to our students going out there. Um, even if even if your program's not doing that, you know, you're you're not even a film major. You're you know, you're something else. You're in business or advertising or, you know, <laughs> economics or something. Um, just you can look outside of the classroom, too. And that's what UOL does. Like Unreal Online Learning provides that free of cost with learning paths, but also the ability uh, to get exposed to larger parts of the engine. So I think one thing we might all agree on is while you can be super specific with what you want to learn Unreal for, part of the joys of working in a real-time software that's based around game engine technology, even for linear content, is you're going to find so many additional uses for everything else in the engine that will help you on your storytelling creative process. So for instance, when I started learning Unreal at first, I it was at zero interest in Blueprint because I was like, hey, I'm just going to make movies. Like, I don't need to know Blue. I don't know how to code. Uh, I literally don't. Like, I never studied it. Um, within, you know, a couple months, though, I'm not going to say I was a Blueprint expert. I might be considered a little bit better than a generalist now, but it's like I use Blueprints for every linear media project that I'm working on because it helps me automate things. It helps me do cues, helps me do all sorts of stuff. So when you get into Unreal to do this sort of stuff, whether it's using Faceware for facial performance capture or just learning how to translate your ideas into something tangible and out something that you can share with the world, I would encourage you also to do other classes on Unreal Online Learning or check out other videos on YouTube or, you know, even if in your college or your school, you're able to take other courses because anything that you can learn, all the other soft skills that you can bring to this uh, is going to help you be a, a much better artist and creator. Um, so the, the way that I would position that is if you're going to take, you know, one of the OL classes or watch a YouTube series on game design, 
take it with the core idea of understanding, well, how can I apply that to my work? Even though I might not want to make a game, there's all these things I'm going to be learning here that could actually have a ripple effect into how I set up my film projects or how I set up, you know, anything like that. Like the, the quickest example I can give, and then I promise I'll shut up, is the blueprint for a character. Like I, I, a lot of times we used to just put characters, the skeletal mesh, into our track and sequencer. In fact, even some of our old learning material had it just done that way, where they, they, were, they just use the skeletal mesh. Ignoring the fact that you can use a blueprint to create a highly customizable proce you know, procedural elements to your character, have physics constraints, all that sort of stuff to do secondary animation. This might sound super intimidating, but it's not. It's actually a pretty easy thing to learn, all things considered, uh, with this technology. So I would encourage people to sort of get out of your lane when learning Unreal. Um, you know, have that focus bit of training where you have your objectives, but do not be afraid at all to essentially use other training materials in service of goals that you may have, because you'll never, you'll never really know until you try it. And then the last thing too, for your demo reels is, you know, I, I'm in a position, uh, quite frequently throughout the year where I hire people, uh, for jobs and I'm always looking at demo reels. Number one thing I'm going to tell you about that is, uh, when if you're following a demo where it's YouTube or it's Unreal Online Learning, follow it with your own creation. Um, be brave. Do that. You don't need to follow it to a T. You can follow the instruction to a T, but make it your own. Because the last thing people like seeing is the exact same thing in 20 reels over and over again. So I would encourage you when you're doing that uh, to take it, make it your own. Put your own spin on it because bringing what you have to bear in any tutorial situation, unless it's a highly objective workflow that has no malleability, you will bring your own, what you what you can bring to it in that process. So thereby when you're done with the demo or the tutorial or the project, you have something relatively unique that stands alone. You've learned the concepts, but now it's yours. Hopefully that makes sense. And that would be my biggest piece of advice to a student. Yeah. Which is, it's great advice. It really, truly is. So I don't want to run too long and take up too much of all of your time. So I figure we have one last question. We'll spitball it out for everyone and see where we land. There was a question. Why should someone or a studio consider going from traditional animation workflows over to newer, more accessible motion capture pipelines? Who wants to start? <laughs> yeah, who wants to <laughs> Go take ahead, I, Simon. <laughs> I, I could take it. Um, as somebody, as somebody who comes with the, the rigging background, we always thought that automating our own workflow was eventually just making ourselves obsolete. We always thought that as long if I have this process that is essentially doing my job, then what am I good for? Well, technically, it's replacing all the trivial tasks and the menial things and the things that that we end up doing on a repetitive basis that waste so much time. So. I, that's the approach that I take when we start automating or finding these tools that allow us to create a larger volume of animations. It's not to replace our, our work. It's basically giving us a better head start. Um, the same way as somebody who would use traditional pencil and, and paint finds that they're able to do a lot more work in a digital software or something like that. It really depends on what is your end goal. And so if volume is something you're trying to do, then starting off with this sort of performance capture gives you that uh, not just a little head start, a huge head start. And then you can spend more of your time doing the polish work or doing the planning or the storyboarding or the, you know, all those other steps that take a lot of time and cannot be automated. So I would think that those systems and, and processes actually help us to, to just improve the overall quality of our work. Yeah, on my side, I would think like, so the, now we invent the car, right? Everybody's driving, but we never stop walking. We're still walking. So this is just a new technology that helps that we get a place faster, easier. So everything based on for the things we are doing right now, actually, is all about storytelling. Anything can help to um, tell us a good story, then we can use it. So let's say a story that needs a cartoony animation that we can keyframe it. And then uh, if, a character, if, if a game that needs to be more realistic, then we performance capture it. So it's all about te uh, techniques, right? So techniques will keep uh, technology will keep improvement, but my advice is um, don't forget about your surrounded things. Like talk to your grandma, grandpa, right? Talk, uh, go uh, to eat with your uh, parents and talk to your friends. Everything is about life experience, 
And then let's say you hear a very interesting story from a grandpa, then actually you can make it into a, a very touching story that you can put it into your Unreal project. So it's all about storytelling for me. So yeah. So I'll, I'll go to that. Uh, my youngest daughter has a, a phrase for a question like this and in, in, in terms of finding the answer. And it's like, there are so many delicious choices. Um, the, uh, some of them are, you know, that these pipelines tend to be faster and less expensive, but um, there's some of these things that are uh, less, less recognized right away. So number one, it, with these more indie accessible, you have uh, access to a much broader set of potential workforce, right? So if uh, students and indies are working with these tools and those are the tools that you are using inside your studio, that's less training time and cost for you as you onboard folks that are already familiar with those tools. Um, th there's one other thing to watch out for is that these tools are fast and um, they're inexpensive. And uh, if you don't start adopting them, we'll be competing against the folks that do. So um, it's good to, you know, try to stay ahead of the curve. There you go. Yeah, great point. <laughs> if you don't want to use the tools, Somebody else will. So. Somebody else will. <laughs> and I, I think for right. students, yeah, for students, that's a that's a really, or you know, people starting out, even if it's a career change situation, um, it's like you know, do your research. You know, I mean, if you just look at the reel that we showed earlier today, it's like, I mean, I would say most of you would be familiar with almost all the content placed in that reel, and the fact that that software specifically is now available in this way, um, I think, just is so exciting, and you know as we're starting to see this in academic programs, you know, being fully integrated, it's like, you know, obviously most people who work in this industry did not go to school for this stuff, but that is a certain amount of people that work in this industry. So the fact that it's still, it is being worked into those sort of curriculums and those sort of workflows means sort of like what Nick is saying. It's like, well, if you're not going to do it, somebody else is, right? I mean, it's because it's just that much more out there and that shouldn't be viewed as a scary thing to think about. It's more just like, you know, we're, we're getting standardized tools that are going to exist across all levels of production and workflow. And right now, out of the gate, Faceware seems to be, you know, in, in first, if not very close. It, because if we think about nonlinear editing, all the other softwares that we consider standard, you know, it took a little bit of time. There's been some back and forths with those sort of things. But, you know, if you wanted to be a filmmaker in general, you were taught to learn Avid or Premiere. We don't, we don't speak about Final Cut anymore, right? But, you know it's it's going to be the same thing with this sort of stuff right yeah. you're going to have like these will have to be a part of that toolkit obviously i think it's going to get easier and easier to learn but i i that's why personally as an academic i've told the people i work i feel like it's it would be irresponsible of me at the very least not to introduce the idea of this software whether it be unreal or faceware uh to my students because it's going to have such a ripple effect going forward yeah, absolutely. And then last but not least, how about you, Gabby? What's your pitch for adopting some of these motion capture tools? <laughs> um, I have to say that when I found out about virtual production, I didn't know what it was. I found out about it because I wanted to see what kind of skills they were looking for at Lightstorm at James Cameron's uh, company. And since he's always, always at the cutting edge of technology, of course, there was something on there. I was like, I don't know what virtual production is, but I'm going to get really good at that. And um, yeah, Matt Workman's Facebook page, somebody asked her like, how do I learn virtual production? And he's like, just install Unreal Engine and go from there. And it turns out that how it's, it's being used with LED for like photorealistic lighting and you know, people utilizing it with camera tracking, people using green screen and being able to also use camera tracking. And you can literally put your uh, real actors in any scene in the world. I want to make a film that takes place in Antarctica. I might not be able to go to Antarctica, but I can actually make this happen with uh, Unreal. And I'm doing all in engine, which is full CGI. So a motion capture setup is absolutely essential because you can have incredible environments, but you kind of need people to, you know, bring them to life. And the face is, I believe, the hardest, the hardest Thing to master. Everyone talks about the uncanny valley. However, with the way technology is evolving, 
shifting. You're looking at how AI and robotics are really kind of emerging. And like you look at like what some of these, uh, I was just looking at like what Hanson Robotics is doing and, you know, Sophie and, you know, she's making facial expressions and you're thinking to yourself, you're like, you know, eventually we're going to have the opposite issue of the uncanny valley. We won't know what's real and what's not anymore. So maybe we should just kind of like enjoy this moment, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Fully agree. So on that note, tell us, do you guys have any future projects that you've got in mind that you want to tell us about? I'll be presenting uh, the, the facial pipeline of uh, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy at GDC this Monday. I know GDC is uh, kind of this big event that's uh, sort of behind closed walls for game developers, but it's still something that's kind of exciting. And uh, who knows if it'll pop up on their YouTube page in the near future, so it's something to look out for. And then eventually there's another UOL course that I'm working on uh, that will also be coming out in the near future. So I'm excited to seeing uh, those come to light. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Nick, you were saying you had some stuff too? All I was saying was that I have a lot of motion capture courses to teach as <laughs> going forward. And uh, so, you know, especially for anyone who's in high school, you should be taking a look at Drexel. You really should. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. Keep an eye out for that. <laughs> Anyone else have any future projects you want to talk about, promote a little bit? I have well, the that... face for webinar oh, yeah. next week. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I'm doing a face webinar. If people want to know about like my in-depth kind of uh, metahuman motion capture workflow with faceware, um, it'll be next Thursday. Awesome. And we will continue to support this faceware learning path with, yeah, the release of uh, uh, three more courses this year. So please keep an eye on Unreal uh, Online Learning for that. Uh, we'll be posting all the content there in the same format you all are familiar with. Um, please feel free at any time to look me up and reach, reach out if you have any questions about any of this stuff uh, from an Epic standpoint. I'm more than happy to answer questions. Uh, I believe we were able to get the link to an imager album with uh, the custom helmet, you know, requirements. That was taken just ev just to put that out. There, that was taken from one of Corey Strasberger's posts that he made a long time ago. He's doing some incredible work. Uh, so that was his DIY helmet. So I want to make it clear. I did not put. I did not come up with that. It didn't come with an instruction list. But if you watch the videos, and this is if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to walk you through it uh, to to work through any of that. But yes, please keep an eye out on Unreal Online Learning. Uh, we're gonna have a lot more of these things. And I guess my most immediate project is I will have to walk that dog. Uh, very shortly because she is scratching <laughs> the gate. Uh, yeah. yeah, definitely don't want to hold anything up on that too much. But Jax, how about you? Do you got anything? From a personal, actually, I'm teaching a um, online class, but in China. Uh, so I'm speaking Mandarin because I think there's not many um, Mandarin speaking course, uh, animation course for them. So I'm um, also doing for work, I'm doing something for Disney Plus right now. Very cool. Very cool. So we'll have to keep an eye out for that one. <laughs> <laughs> but on that note, thank you so much, all of you, for taking the time to speak with us in our community today. And thank you, everybody who came to watch as well. We post all of our streams in video format that can be viewed on demand on our YouTube channel, Unreal Engine. Don't forget to keep up with us at Unreal Engine on all social media, as well as come say hi in our forums where you can get the latest news and also find all the links associated with today's stream. Also, don't forget to take a second and follow everybody else on this wonderful panel. Make sure you follow their great work. Keep up to date with a lot of the stuff they're doing, as well as their classes and webinars and future work. But with that, once again, Thank you all so much for coming today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your very, very busy schedules to sit down and chat with us about this really cool software and some really innovative ways to use it. Awesome. Yeah, thank you all so much. This was absolutely awesome. Thank you. Absolutely.